I'm Glenn McGinnis, and this is Outburst. On the program, will you be voting for a different party in the next election? Um, I don't think so. I think I'll, I'll keep my vote the same. Yes, I will be. Um, I'll be voting for the same party I voted for last time. Change is always good. The writing may be on the wall for the governing Liberal Party as polls suggest a strong lead by the Conservatives hovering somewhere around 15 points. Pollsters are suggesting that if an election were held today, it could mean a majority for the Conservative Party. But it isn't election time and anything can happen during a campaign. So when it comes time to vote once again federally, will you be sticking with your tried and true party or will you be changing things up? Our question. Will you be voting for a different party in the next election? Yes, I will be. Uh, things in the country have changed a lot over the last couple of years since the last federal election. I think priorities are different for a lot of people. Uh, what may have been a priority for me four years ago isn't the same that was a, a priority the last time I voted and probably different even so than the time before that. So, uh, you know, I'm at that stage of my life where you start to mature. Things that are important to you are a little bit different election by election. And I'm certainly noticing that in what my voting intentions are for the next election. Different party than what I first, that I voted for. I usually vote for one party. The only time I did vote for a different party was when I was trying to eliminate the Conservatives, so I voted reform, if you can believe it. Yes, I will. Why? I'm not satisfied with the uh, current uh, government we have, and uh, I think uh, it's just time for a change. Well, probably yes, and the reason is just change is always good. Yeah. It doesn't matter if the actual government, how good or how bad it is, I'm always for the change and the change brings always new things. And I think our Prime Minister have been long enough. He has done his best. He might be out of ideas. He might be stressed like everybody else, every other CEO, every other leader. That's normal. I do not know who I would vote for in the next election. I don't think there is a party currently that represents my viewpoints uh, and no candidates that specifically identify with the situations I'm facing on a regular basis. I would like to vote. I'll have to make a decision closer to. I'm probably a, a fence voter, I guess, at the moment. Um, I don't think so. I think I'll, I'll keep my vote the same. I think I still agree with um, kind of what their, what their policies are and what, what their changes are going to be and what their plan is for the future. And I think me as a student, um, I think it, it probably affects me more and affects me uh, in a different way than if I were to change my vote. Um, and generally speaking, I think the, per the, the party I voted for is just the best party out of all the options. I will not be, no. Uh, can you tell us why? Yeah, um, I still feel like I'm really aligned with my party's views. Um, and I don't think anything has changed necessarily with that party. And I also think that some of the policies that they're looking to bring in kind of align with my beliefs and my values. So, Most of the choices are not that impressive to me right now, but um, yeah, like I think that's probably it. But I'm content with the, at least federally, the kind of government I have, less with the provincial. Uh, yes, definitely. Why? Well, I'm not particularly happy with this government, that's why, yeah. You think it's time for a change? Absolutely, yeah. In my opinion, yeah. No. What? Staying true to what my uh, my late dad taught me and it served me well. Okay. Madam, you. Yes. Why? Um, because there's certain things that I would like to see changed um, that would better the population for Canada. I'm not going to lie. I voted Liberal last time, but I won't be voting Liberal this time. I definitely ain't voting PC, though. I like ND NDP. Undecided right now. Why are you undecided? Can you tell me that? Well, where things are going, I'm not sure. I want to see what's... It's not who's available, who's... You just don't have that many candidates that you can pick from, so... I would say, at this point, no. Okay. And... Um, I think everything is okay now. I mean, there's a lot of issues, but uh, uh, I don't think another party would make that dramatic of a, a situation. You have to give these people a few years, you know. A four-year term sometimes just isn't long enough. Um, I think I just wasn't 
as knowledgeable the first time I did and now I've actually taken time to learn a bit more and I think now I'll actually feel more confident about my vote. Okay, and you? Um, I'll be voting for the same party I voted for last time. Yeah. Okay. Um, Why? Well, I didn't vote. Um, the party I voted for wasn't in power last time and it's still not in power this time. And I think our country needs to go in a new direction. I have been voting for the same party since I'm 18. You're going to keep it up. Always. The debate over public health care versus private health care in this country continues as countless Canadians continue to fall through the cracks of the public system with long wait times that can take months or even more versus a private system that can reduce those wait times, but you'll have to pay up. But would a two-tiered health care system provide some relief to patients looking to gain access to a family doctor, or would the private sector attract health care workers away from the public system? We took this question to Canadians. Are private clinics a viable solution to Canada's health care crisis? I don't think that would be the solution. I think offering people better wages and more jobs would be the solution because there is a lot of gaps that need to be filled. Great answer. And yourself? Um, with my experience with private clinics, it's not the solution. Um, I think they're too expensive, um, you know, like most insurance don't cover private uh, places, so, and most people don't have insurance, so. I would rather that we built up our own system. I don't see the benefit of it, and they certainly get funded at levels that certainly our uh, regular system does not, so I'm not a huge fan. Uh, I think it depends on what the cl private clinic will be specifically used for. Um, Personally, I think that public health care could, could be like a better use of resources, but I mean, I, I guess it would depend on how the government is using those funds to have like, uh, I would say like a proper public health care and not necessarily like any kind of system. Because right now I've been hearing that the hospitals aren't doing that great and we would like to see that be a little better. Uh, no. Um, in my opinion, I think... Uh, private health care is probably one of those things that is more detrimental than it is um, beneficial. Uh, like if we look at other countries, mainly the states, who have private health care systems, you can see just just how much uh, of a necessity health care is and how many people don't get it. So I think implementing private clinics uh, in this country would probably be a detriment. Half the clinics here don't even work. If you're not a patient on their list, you're not being seen. My family doctor, for one, I can't even get a hold of. So I don't think that's necessarily going to help all that much, you know? I mean, maybe for people that can afford it. Um, I was just in the United States for a month, and every single person I met there said, oh, we wish we had your system in Canada. Yes. There, there's no other way. I mean, you need help, you need help. If it's going to, unfortunately, if it it's going to cost a little money, then it's going to cost a little money, but at least you're getting your health care. Um, I think health care is a basic human right that we should all have access to, and we really need to be investing in Canada's health care system more. You hear about what happens in the States where getting some cancer or something like that, if you're not properly insured, can destroy a family or destroy a life. And I just don't think that's the direction Canada should be going into. Yes and no. Why yes and no? Yes, because they create a new uh, way to get people healed. But at the same time, with the amount of taxes we pay in Canada, we should be able to get proper medicine without having to pay for it. Yes. Why? Well, because the system is in a crisis right now, and uh, I think more people should be able to pay for whatever they can afford if ever this would represent something extra uh, and take a little bit of the burden of the health system right now. Never. Why? Because you shouldn't have to pay for your care and there's so many people that are uh, left um, out of the uh, ability to afford any specialized care and um, in BC, you know, I think that's really important. You know, we've relied on uh, public uh, services in the hospital and drop-in clinics and they're doing good as far as um, having um, different, uh, um, uh, sorry, different, it's not just walk-in, but we're actually creating another level of care clinics and uh, it's working out really well. Okay, and what about you, what do you think? 
Oh no, I think it's a terrible idea because all it does is create a further division between those that have money and those that are low income. And then their care is different, their health is different, and it just creates a bigger divide around. And universal health care is something Canada is supposed to be proud of, not something we need to get rid of. I, I've been asked that question many, many times. Like private, private clinics are available about 80 miles to the south. so. You know, you can go there, or if you want to bring them here, that's that, that, that that's a debate. I mean, we've talked, we already have a two-tier system. You, if people who can fly to Seattle or Bellingham, you know, they, they have they have access to uh, health care, alternative health care, uh, anytime they want. Yes. So why, why or why not? Well, to give people an option, and it would, you know, people who can afford it can do it, and then there's more room for the people who are... Yes, yes, I would absolutely go for that, yes. I don't know if I have the knowledge to answer that, to be honest. Uh, if they are, great. If they aren't, then let's stay away from them. Um, you know, there's so much mess and, and so much distrust in the information, unfortunately, these days. Uh, I would love to see a comprehensive study done. Uh, logically, if you can open up more beds and it expedites the process, great. And obviously, there's concerns about people who can't afford that being left behind, which I don't think is... The Canadian healthcare system that most Canadians want. I know it's certainly not the one that I want, um, but anything we can do to alleviate the pressure at this point feels like is what needs to be done. I grew up in California, and even though I'm a Canadian, and private health care in the U.S. is a mess. Uh, it is de uh, destructive to society. I think that private health care has a place to play in the public system to offset the needs today, but at the end of the day, a public system is more fair for the community and for individuals as a whole. In 1965, which future Prime Minister, as a rookie MP, saved former Prime Minister John Diefenbaker from drowning? Was it Pierre Trudeau, Jean Chrétien, or John Turner? Trudeau, Chrétien, or Turner? Trudeau, Chrétien. I'm going to go with uh, Pierre Trudeau. Well, I'll have to guess, I'd say Turner. Uh, Chrétien, Trudeau. Chrétien. I think Chrétien would be funnier. I think it's Chrétien, too. Turner. It is John Turner, my friend. I'm on a roll. You're a good man. <laughs> it was in the winter of 1965 that former Canadian Prime Minister John Diefenbaker was vacationing in Barbados. Coincidentally, future Canadian Prime Minister John Turner was vacationing with his wife in the same location. While at the beach one day, Giles Turner, John Turner's wife, noticed Diefenbaker struggling in the surf. Turner, who was a Rhodes Scholar and an accomplished swimmer, jumped in to rescue Diefenbaker and brought him safely to shore. Diefenbaker thanked Turner, and it was said the two never spoke of the incident again. But when Diefenbaker died in 1979, John Turner was the only Liberal asked to be a pallbearer at his funeral. Beginning earlier this year and spanning into 2025, Canada plans to admit 1.5 million new permanent residents into this country. That's about 500,000 people per year and twice as many as we allowed in between 2010 and 2014. While immigration is one of the foundations this country was built on, affordable housing and higher prices could create some problems without immediate solutions to immigrants looking to come to Canada. So, is this country ready to open its doors to newcomers, or should we have our own house in order first? Our question. Is Canada properly equipped to welcome 500,000 new immigrants per year? At this point, I would say no. Why? I'm Canadian, born, raised. Um, I'm on disability, and I'm, I, I'm having a hard time getting housing. I'm a Canadian that's born and living here. So to bring immigrants in and then start entering into our, our housing system, um, I think a, a, a born and raised Canadian should have first option. And sometimes that's not, the, that's not the issue. That's not the way it works. I think more people would help build Canada, but they don't need to all be in the city. They're, Canada's a big place. We could spread the wealth. 
I, I say no. I think that we do need to have, um, uh, you know, we're having a big shortage in employment as well. We've got to consider that, you know, bringing over some skilled labor and uh, offer some opportunities. And I think that's fair. I, you know, I work with a lot of uh, immigrant groups in, uh, in the city that I live. Um, but uh, at a pace that's going to be, um, at a pace that's going to work for us, that, uh, um, you know, we're not further dividing the people who are not receiving services and uh, we don't have housing, we don't have a solution for that yet. You know, people are just starting to do new builds and it's not enough yet. So that would be my concern. Okay. So I also agree, um, we need to have a better plan that is equal, that it doesn't put further Canadians behind. We have a housing shortage for students and seniors across this country um, and until we're about 10 years from catching up to where we need to be in housing, I would believe. I think it's a challenge. I wouldn't say we're ill-equipped, but we're, it's going to be a challenge to accommodate in terms of housing and uh, medical care and the whole gamut. So. To be honest, I don't know, but I'm ready to welcome 500,000 new immigrants. I think it's going to be a challenge for housing and lots of other reasons, but certainly will make us a more interesting, vibrant country. I wouldn't be able to say 100%, but honestly, through the years when I was back home, because I'm from Honduras, I've been like constantly can Canadian universities would come over and try to like bring people over like UNB UNB came to my school like five times a year so I feel like there is a need for work and there is a need for people so I should I, I definitely would think that they'd be able to handle it yeah I think I'm 50 50 on that I, I don't I I'm not up to date with all that information however in my opinion I do believe that uh, in some way we should be able to support these people who are you know, fleeing these uh, war-torn countries or um, countries that, that have, you know, n that need support economically or are just not the safest place to live in generally. Um, and, and I think that w we as a country and we as a government and we as people, um, as Canadians, we need to step up and, and, and support them in whatever ways we can. And whether that means we give them economic support or we... Um, just kind of you know help them get jobs or we you know even just give them a place to live right uh, I do think that um, whether the whatever the number is I think we should be able to um, support them in whatever ways they need I would say no looking at the housing situation that's going on now like people who have lived here their whole lives can't even afford to live here so it would make no sense to bring a bunch of people here and have them struggle and your thoughts um, we need to take care of our homeless uh, problem before we can welcome um, other people into the country. I think so. Well, we have plenty of land, that's for sure. But, uh, inf well, infrastructure, obviously. We see all the people uh, can't find a place to live and it's super expensive and the health care. And uh, so I would say no, no, we're not, uh, not, in our, uh, not in our infrastructure. My grandfather came over here on a boat from Poland uh, two years before the Second World War, got off at Pier 21 in Halifax. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for immigration, like many of us and most of us. Uh, it's not a question of whether or not Canada is an immigration-friendly country. We are, obviously. Uh, economically, we die without it. We all know that. But where do you put people when we have so many people who can't afford to live right now, who are spending hours waiting in hospitals, uh, no room in schools? Uh, it, it's just not the right time to be pumping the numbers up to half a million a year um, and increasing them the way we have since COVID. Yeah, there's a lot of jobs that uh, the privileged Canadians don't feel like doing. And we need people to work. Housing appears to be an issue, but it'll come along. Tough word to use there. I think we don't have a choice in the way that CPP works. Uh, we need to fill CPP. There are fewer working Canadians. We have an aging population. We need immigration to build our society and continue to grow as a nation. Uh, and we should welcome it with warm arms. Uh, it's how this country was built, and immigrants are, the, are a part of our stability as a country. Our country has been built by people coming to our country. Uh, uh, and I mean, this can go way, way back to, to various indigenous movements prior to, to uh, uh, you know, white contact and these sorts of things. But uh, though those are diff different issues, but it's been built by, by a, a sort of fantastic glory of, of different cultures and different experiences. And I mean, recently we saw a huge influx of people from Syria. And, and I mean, these are, these are very hardworking people. These are people that, that, uh, that are not dissimilar from us at all. Uh, and I think that globally, uh, 
similarities are, are becoming less, or uh, dissimilarities are becoming less and less, and similarities are becoming greater and greater. Uh, so I don't perceive that there being issues of conflict or any of that sort of thing. I, I, I think that we need more people, uh, we need less taxes. Recently, Canada's Environment Commissioner released an audit looking at this country's track record in reducing carbon emissions, and it may not be good news for the federal government. That 40% reduction by 2030 promised by the federal Liberals may come up a bit short at 34%. While Canada has been striving to achieve these climate goals, we still remain the only G7 country that has not achieved any emissions reductions since 1990. So, as the UN Climate Conference gets underway in Dubai, we took this question to Canadians. Do you think Canada is environmentally responsible? No, not really. I mean, we still, the oil sands are still open. We keep building new pipelines. Our cities are still horrifically car dependent. I mean, anywhere west between Montreal and Vancouver, you can't get by without a car. The fact of the matter is, if Canada wants to be considered uh, environmentally conscious, we need to start looking at Europe and designing our urban planning more in the way that they do. Absolutely not. And I think that there's lots of opportunities that we had along the way where successive governments made bad decisions about things. And now we're going to play catch up. I think Canada definitely needs to be more environmentally responsible. Um, I feel like there's a lot that the country is doing that's really good for the environment, but there's a lot of work that needs to be taken place in our country. We've done little things like taking away plastic bags and straws, but there needs to be recycling programs, composting programs. There's a lot, of, a lot more gaps there that need to be filled as well. Uh, to an extent, definitely. Where I come from, we don't really think as much about the environment. I do think that here there are a lot like there is a lot more conscientiousness about it, but I do think that there are certain things that we could do to like increase that activity. I feel like there is a lot of ways that like uh, companies are taking over environmental properties and like I've heard stories of just um, different businesses kind of like um, taking advantage of deforestation and stuff like that. So I do feel like there should be a better feel for what is actually going on with the more powerful individuals. But to one extent, I do feel like Canada is conscientious about it, yeah. So out of how many countries in the world? 160 odd. So in the G7, okay, out of the top seven, maybe not. Are we where we want to be? Maybe not. Are we where we should be? Perhaps not. Are we heading that way? I'd like to think we are. Um, I think you know most Canadians are environmentalists at the end of the day, and that doesn't mean that you believe in the carbon tax. And I think it just means about trying to be good stewards of the planet and good stewards of the land we live on, um, and understanding the the downstream impacts of, of what we do here too. Right? You, know, you look at things like natural gas, uh, and you know what? I hate to be the guy who talks about electric vehicles. They're great. They're awesome, and all that, but. You have countries like China and India who are producing, burning massive amounts of coal to power up the plants to make the batteries for electric vehicles. That doesn't make sense, yet we're you know, withholding our ability to export natural gas, which could be used to power those facilities, which is a, a greener, cleaner fuel than coal is. Um, you know, we do a lot of things. I think we, we try to do the right thing a lot. I don't know if we always do what is actually the right thing. I think that we are told we're far more environmentally responsible than we actually are. Uh, and I mean, that's like any other country. If I talk to somebody from the States, which I do, uh, they think that they are totally environmentally responsible and that, and that we are, you know, this, this, this carbon giant uh, because they see pictures of, of Fort McMurray in the 80s. And, uh, and, and sure, but then we see the same thing from them. And then you've got Germany over there being like, hello, like we're gonna be carbon free in a couple of years, right? Um, so I think we can learn a lot from Europe. I think they're trying, they're, they're, they're trying to move in that direction, but right at the moment, I don't believe we are. No, I think we could be setting a better example for other countries. Well, I, I would think we're environmentally responsible as compared to what, though, you know. I, yeah, I, I believe we are. I, I believe we are, yes. 
Well, because we're a first world nation and uh, we have uh, certain you know, regulations and laws in place as they are right now, you know, I mean, so yes, I think we're responsible. Uh, can we always be better? Sure. Uh, like I said, I think pollution, definitely. Pollution is a problem. Uh, I, would, I would have to say no. I mean, at the end of the day, our, our country is focused on profits over sustainability. Uh, we can have systems in place, for example, the wind farm projects that are going up in Nova Scotia that will be environmentally sustainable, but there's a lot of hurdles to get through to get there. And I just don't think today government is equipped with the tools necessary to move forward with those projects at all levels, municipal, provincial and federal. We try to. Uh, if it's enough, then I don't know. Maybe it depends on what's the baseline compared to what. Uh, compared to Europe, no compared to some other countries, probably, but uh, probably not enough, no. Um, I think we could do better. What, how? Um, like we could invest more in green energy, yeah. You don't think we do enough of that? Nope. I think there's so much more we could do. We were just in the States for a month, and the amount of wind farms, Wisconsin, everywhere, like crazy. Oh, Canada's got a lot of area. And a lot of wind. Not enough. Not even close enough. What? We're just too far behind other countries when we should be leading. For example, as far as I'm concerned, capital of Canada, right? Canada, period, should be leading. Yeah, I think so. To, why, why would you say that? Well, in terms of what they're capable of doing and, and how they're enforcing things, like you know, Envi Environment Canada, how they operate, and the Ministry of the Environment, and climate change, and I mean, again, they have their challenges, but uh, it's, it's in the right direction. I think they're doing a good job, and I think they're really trying. Every province is different, I feel. Um, so, as a country in whole, I, I would say yes. I would say yes. Thanks for watching this episode of Outburst on CPAC. If you have any comments about this show or any other show, you can find us on social media. You can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca. I'm Glenn McGinnis, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Cable Public Affairs Channel, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.